in Amsterdam uh, with Bert Rards and Stefan van Zwam, who was at the CWI but now is at Princeton. So, um, okay, so the object of study are intertwines. Um, so, what is an intertwine? So, uh, let's first define it for graphs, right? So, let G and H be graphs. Uh, so an intertwine of G and H is a graph that contains both G and H as a minor, uh, but if you delete or contract any edge, you lose that property, right? So uh, so it's a minor minimal graph with the following property. with both G and H as a minor. Um, so let's just do an example, right? So if I take uh, G to be, say, a triangle, and H to be, say, a matching. So, oh, right, so, uh, so a minor is, so one graph is a minor of another graph. If you can get this one from this one by deleting edges um, and contracting edges. So contracting an edge, well, deleting an edge is what you think it is. You just remove it. And contracting an edge is where you just shrink the endpoints uh, of the edge to a single vertex. And you might need to delete some isolated vertices. Um, so, Okay, so if G is a triangle and H is this matching, then one intertwine of G and H is just uh, a four cycle, right? So, uh, so this four cycle contains G as a minor, because if I contract an edge, I have this triangle, and it contains H as a subgraph even, right? But if I delete any edge, then I'll lose the property of having this triangle. And if I contract any edge, then I only have three vertices, so I, I don't have a matching. Right. Uh, so this is an intertwine of these two graphs, and the name just comes from <coughs> the fact that they're both sitting in there, but in a kind of complicated manner. Right. So they're intertwined in this graph here. Right. Um, okay. So why do we care about intertwines? Right. So. Uh, there's an old conjecture of Lovash and Unger, right? So, um, and this I think is around 79, right? And they conjectured that if you take any two graphs, uh, the set of intertwines is finite, right? So. there are only finitely many intertwines of G and H. Okay, so, okay, why do we care about this, <laughs> right? So, this is related to the graph miners project of Robertson and Seymour, right? So, um, so, okay, so the two main theorems from graph miners are the graph miners theorem. Uh, and that, so this is Robertson and Seymour. And it says, it's a remarkable theorem, it says that uh, graphs uh, are well quasi-ordered. Uh, so with respect to the minor relation. Uh, so what this means is that if you take any class of graphs that's closed under uh, taking minors, 
there's a finite set of excluded minors, right? So the minor minimal graphs that are not in your class, uh, there's a finite number of them, right? So for example, if you look at planar graphs, uh, the excluded minors are K33 and K5, and this is a vast generalization of, of that theorem, right? And then there's also an algorithmic counterpart to this theorem, which says that uh, minor testing is fast, right? So minor testing uh, is polynomial. Also due to Robertson and Seymour. And this says that if I give you any fixed graph H, uh, you can test if an input graph has H as a minor in polynomial time, right? So that means that if I combine these two theorems, uh, I can test for membership in any minor closed class in polynomial time, right? Because every class has a finite set of excluded minors. And so if I want to test for membership, I just test whether each one of those graphs uh, is a minor of my input graph. Uh, so this is pretty remarkable because, for example, uh, my favorite uh, example to illustrate the power of this theorem is these knotless graphs, right? So a graph is knotless if you can draw it in three space such that every cycle is embedded as the unknot, right? So the unknot is the knot that is not knotted. And uh, so knotless graphs are clearly a minor closed class, right? So if I draw a graph in three space, I delete an edge, it's still knotless. I contract an edge uh, in, in three space, it's, it's that will give you a knotless embedding. So that's a minor closed class. So these two theorems imply that you can test for knotlessness uh, in polynomial time. But before this graph miners project, that problem wasn't even decidable, right? So uh, I mean, there are infinitely number of embeddings that you can test. So that problem wasn't known to be even decidable, but it turns out to be polynomial, right? OK. so. So increasingly, there's an interest in computing excluded minors, right? So this is where these intertwines come in, right? So uh, in general, this cannot be done. So this is kind of, kind of confusing, right? But if I give you a minor closed class of graphs, it turns out that it is, it's not possible to compute a set of excluded minors, right? Depending on how the class, I mean, if I give you the class as its set of excluded minors, then the problem is trivial. But if I give you the class as a Turing machine or uh, some kind of logic formula, then you, in general, you cannot compute the excluded minors, right? Uh, but there's growing interest in being able to compute excluded minors, and this is where these intertwines come in, right? So, so for example, if I have a minor closed class of graphs and I have another minor closed class of graphs, well, their union is another minor closed class of graphs, right? So if I knew the excluded minors for one class, and I knew the excluded minors for the second class, then, I mean, these intertwines, so any excluded minor of their union is going to be an intertwine of an excluded minor for the first class and an excluded minor for the second class, right? So if I could get a computable bound on the size of an intertwine of two graphs, then that would give me a way to compute excluded minors for unions of minor closed families, right? So uh, that's some motivation. You can forget about that. Um, uh, okay. So I mean, of course, this answer was answered in the affirmative by this first theorem, right? Because uh, the set of intertwines is an anti-chain of graphs, right? So it's finite by this first theorem. But incidentally, there is not a simple proof of this fact, right? So every proof of this intertwining theorem uses some graph minor structure theory. So it would be nice if someone could prove this in some elementary way, right? OK, so this conjecture is now a theorem, okay. right, by this, by this theorem, for example. And uh, and a constructive version uh, has been proven, right? So if you actually want uh, some explicit function that bounds the size of two intertwines, that's also been proven. But it uses this unique linkage theorem. Um, so this is a theorem mm -hmm. now, uh, but it doesn't have a simple proof, right? Okay, so. 
I guess we wanted to think about this for matroids, right? So, uh, so what about matroids? Uh, don't worry, I will define matroids um, later, right? Um, so it's been conjectured that uh, this same theorem uh, is true for matroids which are representable over a fixed finite field, right? So uh, conjecture. Um, this is kind of folklore, so I'm not exactly sure who this is due to. Probably Robertson and Seymour, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the conjecture is that, uh, so I've got two uh, matroids. Uh, uh, so these are F representable. I'll say what this means later. Um, uh, where F is a fixed finite field. Um, so I've got two matroids, which are representable over a fixed finite field, and the theorem is that there's a finite number of intertwines, right? So uh, then M1 and M2 have a finite number of intertwines. Okay, so um, right. So even the so as I mentioned, even the the graph version of this conjecture was hard to prove, and uh, this is believed to be true, but and and probably will be proved uh, eventually, uh, but it will probably need some tools from matroid structure theory, right? So in this talk. We're going to be more modest, um, and instead of intertwining um, matroids or minors, we're going to intertwi intertwine connectivities, right? So I'll I'll define that also later, right? Is this conjecture, uh, in this conjecture, you do you restrict the intertwines to be representable or not? Uh, uh, no, no. Uh, no. Um, okay, so. Uh, right, so I'll define things uh, later. Um, I'll just remark that uh, this, this assumption here of the finite field is essential, right? So it turns out that um, without this assumption, you can construct uh, two matroids with an infinite number of intertwines, right? So um, that was... Vertigan, uh, unpublished though, um, and so he, he constructed, so there exists um, matroids M1 and M2 uh, with an infinite number of intertwines. So, okay, uh, so I will define matroids uh, as promised. Right. Okay, okay, so what is a matroid? Uh, Okay, so a matroid is some kind of abstraction of the notion of linear independence, right? So, so, so a matroid uh, is a pair. Uh, so you've got a finite ground set E, 
and uh, this function r, which we call a rank function, right? And this rank function uh, satisfies some axioms, right? So, so r is a function from the set of subsets of E, uh, satisfying uh, some very reasonable uh, axioms that you would expect uh, independence structures to have, right? So, so the first axiom is that uh, the rank of a set uh, should be uh, non-negative, and it should be at most its size. Right? Uh, so this is for all subsets of E, right? Uh, there should be some monotonicity, right? So the rank of a set should be at most the rank of any superset of it, right? So if A is a subset of B, right? And the third axiom is um, submodularity, right? So the rank of A plus the rank of B uh, is at least as much as the rank of their intersection plus the rank of their union. Uh, Okay, so that's a matroid, and there are many equivalent ways to define them, right? So I define them in terms of um, the rank function, but you can define them in terms of uh, independent sets or bases or circuits. Um, and the fact that they have a lot of different axiomatizations kind of shows that they're a pretty robust object. So. So some examples, uh, and I think the only ones that will be relevant for this talk are uh, so let G be a graph. Uh, so if I set uh, E to be equal to the set of edges of G, so the matroid is on the edge set of G, and I define the rank uh, of a set of edges uh, to equal uh, the size, or let's say, the number of, the number of edges uh, in a maximum size forest. Uh, contained in A, right? So I've got some set of edges A, and I just pick a maximum size forest uh, inside A, and that number I define to be the rank of A, right? So if you are bored, you can check that that does give you a rank function, right? Um, okay. And the second example are uh, matroids that arise from matrices, right? So um, let M uh, be a matrix uh, with entries uh, from some field, not necessarily finite, some field F, right? And so this matrix has its so the ground set of this matroid will be the set of columns of this matrix, right? So, so E is this set here, right? And the rank of a subset of columns, so say this is A here, right? So the rank of A is just going to equal, well, its rank, right? So uh, the rank of this submatrix, so M restricted to A, right? Uh, so again, if you're bored, it's easy to check that this also gives you uh, a rank function of a matroid. And in fact, um, I've really only given one example because uh, graphic matroids are actually special cases of uh, matroids representable with matrices, right? Um, so, okay. So in order to state 
our theorem, I need to introduce Metroid connectivity, right? So Metroid connectivity. Okay, so um, okay, so let M be a Metroid. Um, okay, and let A be a subset of elements of the matroid, right? So the first thing we define is some kind of uh, connectivity of A, right? So the, so the connectivity of A, right, I'm going to define to be equal to, um, OK, so it's going to be equal to the rank of A plus the rank of the complement of A uh, minus uh, the rank of the entire matroid. Right. Um, okay, so uh, this function satisfies some nice properties, right? So, for example, um, it's symmetric, right? So the rank of a set, or sorry, the connectivity of a set is equal to the connectivity of its complement, right? Um, it's actually pretty easy to check that it's clo it's invariant under duality as well, right? So every matroid has a dual. Uh, I haven't defined what the dual is, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, basically, the dual the dual matroid is the matroid you get by uh, taking all your maximal independent sets; those are the bases, and taking the complements of those sets uh, as your new bases. So that's that's the dual matroid. Uh, you can write the dual function out if you wanted. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, this function is invariant under duality, right? So the connectivity function is the same for a matroid and its dual. Um, and again, it's easy to check that it's uh, also monotone undertaking minors. So once I start taking minors, this connectivity will not go up. It might go down. Uh, it could stay the same, right? Um, okay. So, and if you think about it, even in terms of graphs, right, so it sort of generalizes graph uh, connectivity, right, in, in some sense, right? So if I have a graph and say I have something like a two separation here, right, so, uh, so for example, let's, let's imagine that uh, this part of the graph is uh, connected and this part is connected, right? So there are some vertices here. There are some vertices here, right? Uh, so if I look at, say, this is A and this is B, right? Then if I actually just compute what this number is, right? So suppose there are, um, I don't know, K vertices here, uh, L vertices here. Um, K, K is this number, L is this number. Um, or maybe, no, maybe I'll just let K be the whole thing. So if I actually compute what this number is, this basically encodes the size of this separation here, right? Because the rank of this set of edges is just going to be the number of vertices here uh, minus one, because that's the size of a spanning tree on this side, right? So I'll get uh, k minus one, right? Or here, I'll put it up here. So I'll get uh, k minus one for this quantity here. And the size of, uh, right, so the rank of this side is going to be the number of vertices minus one here. So this is going to be a L minus one, right? And then I'm going to subtract out um, the size of a spanning tree of the whole thing, right? But I've, I've double counted here, right? So, so in general, it's going to be K plus L, right? Uh, but I've counted these things twice. So there's a minus two here. And then I minus one from that, right? So if I add up these things, um, then I will get something like uh, one or something, 
Right, so this turns out to be a one separation. Um, maybe two was too small of a number to illustrate, right? Um, but basically this number is going to encode the number of vertices here uh, up to a factor of uh, plus or minus one, right? Um, so it does generalize graph connectivity, this, this function uh, lambda, right? So what is the connectivity of the matrix? I didn't understand. Uh, so this is the connectivity of just a set, right? Okay. And, okay. And... So you haven't set it yet? I haven't set it okay. yet, right? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the connectivity of the matroid, actually this won't be important for us uh, in this talk, but it's going to be, like a, like a graph, it's going to be the minimum order of a, of a separation like this, right? So, uh, so it's going to be the minimum of this lambda m of a, um, where, of course, you want both of these sides to kind of be big, right? In a, so in a... You don't really want, I mean, if one of these things is, is small, right, then you don't really want to count that as a, as a separation, um, right? So a separation uh, is going to be something like this. So a k separation is where uh, this lambda m is at most k, and both sides have, say, at least uh, k elements inside, right? But that's not important, actually, for, uh, for this talk. Um, Okay, so what is important is kind of some um, uh, Menger-like connectivity between subsets, right? So, uh, uh, so so let A and B uh, let A and B. Be disjoint subsets of the ground set. Uh, so I define this kappa M uh, between A and B to be equal to the minimum uh, of this lambda M of X, right? Uh, where A is contained in X, this is disjoint from B, right? So basically, I've got a subset of elements here. I've got another subset of elements here, right? And the, this kind of connectivity between them is the minimum cut that separates them, right? The order of a minimum cut. So, so there's going to be some set X here, right? And among all possible choices of x, right, so I choose x containing a, uh, but disjoint from b, I compute this uh, lambda number, right, and the one that's the smallest, uh, I define to be this kappa number, right. So that's like uh, connectivity between vertices in a graph, right. So you have a subset of vertices here, subset of vertices here. What is the smallest cut that separates them, right? Um, so this is this number, right? Um, so now I think I can state our theorem. Uh, <coughs> our theorem, right? So Right, so, okay, so our theorem says that, so let M be, uh, say, an FQ representable matroid, right? So FQ representable means, uh, so I already defined that uh, matrices give rise to matroids, right? And if the entries of that matrix uh, come from this finite field FQ, then you say it's FQ representable, right? So if I give you some abstract matroid, I can ask whether it is representable by some matrix, actually, right? And depending on the entries that I allow in that matrix, um, 
you can represent different classes of matroids, right? So, um, so this is an FQ representable uh, matroid. And we basically have um, four subsets of elements, and they have full connectivity to each other, or, or in pairs, right? So, uh, so, and let S1, T1, S2, T2 uh, be subsets of elements um, satisfying Um, so, so let's say that uh, all of these sets have the same size. Uh, equals k, right? And that they have a full connectivity uh, to each other, right? So the connectivity um, in M between S1 and T1 is equal to k. Um, and the connectivity between S2 and T2 is also equal to K, right? And our theorem says that, well, if your matroid is big enough, so there is some constant uh, which only depends on K and uh, the field, not on the matroid itself, uh, where if your matroid is bigger than this constant, uh, you can delete or contract an edge uh, keeping this connectivity between both both pairs of subsets, right? So, um, okay, so there exists a constant um, C, right? So C depends on uh, just this Q and K, but not on the not on the rank of the matroid itself, uh, such that if M has more than or C elements, um, uh, so. So if your matroid is huge, bigger than this constant, um, there will exist uh, some edge or some E in your ground set uh, such that uh, you can delete it and keep both of these connectivities. Uh, or you can contract it and keep both of these connectivities, right? So you've uh, intertwined these connectivities. This is an intertwine of, of these connectivities, right? So, so kappa of M contract E between S1 and T1 is equal to K uh, and equal to uh, or you can delete something. So Okay. All right. Um, so, okay. I actually haven't defined deletion and contraction in matroids, um, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I f I'll just state it for a representable matroids because that's the only thing we care about in this talk. Um, uh, so if you have some um, matrix and you've got some column that you want to delete or contract, right? Um, then the deletion is easy, right? So if I want to just delete this element from the matroid, you just delete its column and uh, you look at uh, this submatrix, and that's uh, that's m delete e. And if you want to contract it, um, so what you need to do is uh, perform some row operations until uh, you get exactly one one in this column. And then what you do is you delete the column and you also delete this row here. Uh, so then this submatrix is a uh, representation of M contract E. Right? Um, and 
If you think of uh, these representable matroids as just points in projective space, which is what you probably should do, right? Because that doesn't affect the uh, dependence between the, between the columns. Uh, then what this contraction is, is basically you've got some point you want to contract, right? Then you just pick some hyperplane uh, that's disjoint from this point, and you project all the other points onto this hyperplane uh, through this point. Um, I mean, that's what this operation is doing, right? Uh, if you don't get that, it doesn't matter, right? So, okay, so that's deletion and contraction. And so, um, okay, so this is our theorem. Um, it turns out that uh, you can do a bit better than this. Um, it turns out that you can intertwine um, uh, a connectivity here, and you can keep a, f a fixed minor. So, so it turns out that you can actually intertwine a minor with a connectivity. Uh, that's what we proved, but I didn't write it down. And um, I mean, that's pretty much as far as it, I mean, our proof will not be able to intertwine two, two matroids, two f representable matroids. Um, okay, so, uh, all right, so let me uh, show how the proof goes. Um, at least for graphs, right? So, uh, so I'll give the proof for graphs, and then I'll show, if I have time, uh, how to kind of matroidize the proof for graphs, right? So, if you wanted to prove this theorem for graphs, uh, how would you go about doing it? Um, okay, so the statement for graphs, uh, analogous statement for graphs, would be something like um, you've got, say, k vertices here. Uh, that have full connectivity to another set of k vertices, and you've got, uh, I don't know, some other set of vertices that you want to link up. Right. So, um, so the graphic version would be you've got two, p two subsets of, two pairs of uh, subsets uh, that have full connectivity to each other, and you want to prove that if your graph is huge, then you can delete or contract an edge and keep both of these connectivities, right? Um, okay, so okay, so the first thing to note is that uh, uh, so because these things have full connectivity to each other, uh, we can apply Menger's theorem, uh, which says that there actually is uh, a linkage between this set and this set, right? So there is a set of disjoint paths that looks like that. And there's also another set of disjoint paths between these guys. All right. So, uh, right. So the point is that uh, we can make some observations, right? So we will try to take. Uh, so imagine that this is some kind of minimum counterexample, right? So in a minimum counterexample. Um, this, uh, the set of red edges and the set of white edges uh, has to be disjoint, right? Because if there was an edge that was both white and both pink, then I could contract it and keep the connectivity between both, right? So, so these two sets of edges uh, are, are disjoint and they are the entire graph itself, right? Because if there were any other edge, I could delete that edge and keep the connectivity uh, between both, right? These these paths ensure that I have the connectivity that I need, right? So this is the full graph here. And moreover, I mean, one of these linkages has to be huge, right? Because if they were both small, then I'd be done. So, so imagine this white linkage is very, very long, right? So um, uh, I'm just going to draw another picture. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> that's right. Thanks. Um, okay. Okay, so I've got this uh, subset of here and this white linkage. And this white linkage is very long. Right. So, um, 
if I look at just these vertices here, right, and if I move sequentially along, um, it's pretty easy to show that I get a sequence of separations, a sequence of, of four separations in this case. So I get uh, a bunch of lines, a long, long sequence, and all of these sets are separations of my graph. Uh, so on until I reach here. Right. Um, so they could be, right? So this vertex could be that vertex or whatever. I mean, basically, uh, I can shift one vertex at a time until I reach all the way over here. So as I move along here, uh, these sets of, this four sets of vertices, that's going to have to be a four separation. Otherwise, um, well, if it wasn't, that means a few things could happen, right? There could be some pink edge that goes here, but then you could do some rerouting, right? So, uh, so these are actually separations. Uh, some of these vertices might be the same, right? Um, so, and so now, but the point is that this uh, sequence of separations is huge, right? Because this white, this white linkage is, is as long as I want it to be, right? I'm trying to prove some bound. Um, so the way that the pink uh, linkage interacts with it is pretty controlled, right? So, so for example, I can assume that um, that these guys, say going from right to left, intersect the pink vertices in the same way um, for as long as uh, as long as I like, right? So, um, so for example. There are some pink vertices, but I can assume that uh, the set of pink vertices I see uh, from the from the right is always the same, right? Um, so maybe I don't know. Maybe there's these three pink vertices uh, on the right side, right? So then, um, okay. So I look. To the right, there's maybe four vertices here. There's always the same three uh, pink vertices here, let's say, right? And uh, what I can do is I can just keep track. So I number these things, I say one, two, three, four. That thing is five, six, seven, right? And what I can do is I can just keep track of how uh, the pink paths uh, pass through this part of the graph, right? So it could be that. I don't know, they do something like uh, mm, maybe 6 connects to 7 directly in there, uh, 5 maybe connects to 3, and then maybe 1 goes to 2 and it goes back out or something, right? So the only thing I keep track of uh, are which, which of these vertices are kind of matched up, right? So I keep track of the, this linking pattern on the right side, right? And it doesn't really matter, but the point is that there's a finite number of ways that these things can be linked up, right? So that means that at some much later date, uh, maybe over here, right? So this is another separation, right? I'm going to see the exact same thing that I see here, right? Because there's only a finite number of ways that these things can pass through. So at this much later date, I've got this uh, 5, 6, 7, and 6 is still linked to 7, uh, 5 is linked to 3, and this 1 is linked to 2 in some way, right? But then I can ask, whoa, whoa, what, what's going on here? Like, uh, I've got this separation, like down here, right? And at this point, well, it's better <laughs> that these things are kind of lined up, but it, it doesn't really matter. So I can ask myself, well, in this strip here, right, I mean, I went from 1 to 2, right, and here I also went in at 1 and I went out at 2, right? So in between, why didn't I just use this white linkage, right? Because this white linkage links things up in the, in links 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3, right? So in the middle here, instead of doing this pink stuff, I could just, uh, reroute by using the, the white linkage, right? So if I use the white linkage uh, together with this part here, I see the exact same linking pattern on the right side, right? So that means that 
I could use this white linkage instead, and I can make these two linkages overlap in an edge, and I contract it, right? Um, so that is the uh, graph theory proof, right? And uh, the point is that pretty much all of this stuff goes through uh, matroidally, right? So we use Menger's theorem, right? Um, but there is a Menger's theorem for matroids, so maybe I'll just um, state that. I should stop at 50 or something like that, or? Um, it's between 50 and 60, but you started a bit. Okay, okay. Uh, all right. So, um, right, so there's, uh, so Tut's linking theorem. Um, so the point is that uh, everything I said uh, for graphs is pretty much like matroidalizable, right? I don't know if I just made that up, but uh, these separations you can still get uh, matroidally. It takes a little bit um, more work because paths, the notion of a path and a matroid isn't really that well defined. Um, but you can still get these uh, separations in the matroid. And what you really want is um, uh, this kind of Menger's theorem that we used as well, right? So if you have uh, connectivity between two sets of vertices, one way to view Menger's theorem is that, well, there is, so if I just look at, that, at those set of paths, then it says that there is some minor of the graph where the connectivity between those things is the same as the connectivity in the in the big in the big graph, right? So Tut's linking theorem says that um, this kappa m uh, between a and b is actually equal to so it's a min-max theorem like Menger's theorem. So it's it's the max of this connectivity um, in N of A, uh, where N is a minor of M, uh, and the edge set of this minor, um, so the edge set of N is just equal to A union B, right? So, uh, so this says that there is some minor uh, that realizes this this connectivity, right? So, this Tut's linking theorem plays the role that Menger's theorem um, did in in this proof, right? Um, okay. Um, and actually, um, from this really is a generalization of Menger's theorem, right? So, from Tut's linking theorem, you can actually prove Menger's theorem, right? Um, so you can think about that uh, if you want. Um, so I think I'll I'll, I'll stop. Here. Okay. Any questions?